Um, I guess like maybe we can kind of get started. We're we'll a admit more people as they're coming in. Um, but thank you all for coming and um, coming to this first like self-care lecture. This is an elective lecture, so um, we appreciate you kind of like showing up and um, like being a part of this conversation. Uh, my name is Leia. I'm a program manager for Lambda, and I'm going to be doing like this first part of the self-care that's more so practical tools, um, what we could do as leaders, as people to kind of help ground ourselves and um, how we could take care of each other. And my partner, Rook is amazing and uh, she could tell you a little bit more about what she'll be doing. Hey everybody, my name is Brooke. I'm here with Baldwin. I'll be covering a section of self-care that's more theoretical, not necessarily um, removed from what Leia will be talking about, but it, it will be asking you to explore the ways in which the debate impacts your personal health. Um, and in terms of like how you relate to an argument um, and how you relate to the other people directly around you, Based off of your personal kind of background, your values, what inform, what makes you uh, you. Um, all these things kind of are affected in how we have a conversation about criminal justice reform and every kind of conversation that we might ha have in debate. But what the section of the conversation that I'll be covering will go into is, is primarily how to apply theoretically what Leia is talking about. For sure. So we hope that like this session is uh, useful. Is this will also be recorded and uploaded on our individual YouTube channel. So um, keep in for that. So um, I guess I'll just get started with sharing my screen. Um, okay. Cool. Um, Y'all can see that. Great. Awesome. Um, okay. So. Healthcare. I'm I'm having a little bit of um, fun with uh, these puns, so if they're kind of cringy, please bear with me. I I like them. Um, so this is going to be part of uh, a little mini lecture series for at least our league in the coming year. Um, I just wanted to kind of like first talk about um, 2020 has been a year. There has been a lot of things going on. Uh, the pandemic, everyday stress, uh, graphic violence, and social media hostility, toxic thinking. And a lot of those toxic thinking can just like seep into your mind. Um, a lot of the times we can't help it. And a lot of the times it's out of anxious thoughts and kind of like out of our control. So I hope that this presentation can provide you with some tools because um, I also needed help with really anxious and intrusive thoughts. So, let's see, did that work? Okay, great. Um, so this is what we're going to be covering, uh, covering in four parts, debating with teenage anxiety. I told you I love puns. So um, first we're going to be going over um, what is mindfulness? Uh, why, why do we need it? <coughs> Second, we're going over uh, AMPS. Um, AMPS stands for automatic negative thoughts. Uh, third, we're going to go over debate and antsy anxiety. Um, again, I love the puns. So uh, why is mindfulness and these kind of things helpful for debaters? And fourth, Vibe checks as practice. I know it kind of sounds crazy, but also vibe checks really do work. Uh, I'm not gonna like try to sugarcoat it with a bunch of um, other terms because vibe checks really do be it. So let's kind of move on. Um, next. So I'm just gonna define mindfulness for a little bit. Uh, mindfulness means maintaining a moment by moment awareness of our thoughts, feelings, body behaviors, um, bodily sensations, surroundings, and environment. Right. Uh, what I want to emphasize is means is we're recognizing it through a nurturing lens. Um, this sounds like something that we should and already are doing, but it's really more difficult in practice, especially when we are self-criticizing ourselves. So being aware of our own thoughts and not just thinking about them is really important for our mental health. Uh, so which bring, brings me to my next slide. Uh, this is really like wild. Uh, we have about 60,000 thoughts per day. We have about like 12,000 to 60,000 thoughts per day. Um, and 80% of them are negative and 95% of them are the same repetitive thoughts. When I first found this out, it was astounding to me because not like this one, um, just being able to count those thoughts and also knowing that ma the majority of our thoughts are just negative. Not only are they ne negative, but 95% of them, most of our thoughts are the same thing that we thought about from the day before. So I kind of want you to put yourself in that place and kind of think, how have I been treating myself? How have, been, how have I been thinking? How have I been thinking about other people? And are those things really helpful? And just kind of, are, are you beating yourself up over it? Because even just seeing this number and seeing how they're all the same, it's really not helpful because we're not 
uh, consuming new information. We're not thinking about new things. All we're doing is just having the same recurring thoughts that really produce a lot of anxiety and a lot of the negative feelings that we do have. So um, there's probably three factors to mindfulness. I know mindfulness is like just being aware of your own thoughts. And I thought like, well, I know what I'm thinking. Um, why do I need this, right? Like, why do I need to think about what I'm thinking? Um, but I kind of want to give some examples, especially um, in debate, we are kind of trained to be combative and be kind of like hostile and assertive in our words that we kind of forget that we are also people and we talk to real people as well, right? <clears throat> so um, I kind of want to go over like these three things because um, this is going to sound so simple, but everything that we do can be condensed down to like three motivations, right? There, there's motivations behind our thoughts and our feelings and our behaviors. Everything that we do uh, could be like really neatly categorized in these um, three things. So first, I want to go over like thoughts. Thoughts are words that pass through your mind, right? So thoughts are your interpretations of the events that are happening. Thoughts are subjective. They are what you think about what you see in the world, right? There are many different thoughts that could be applied to one situation. That's why we have multiple perspectives. So I want you to think as perspectives as thoughts. You know, they're not objective. They are all subjective because they're up our, to our interpretation. Um, secondly, um, feelings, right? We all have these things. Feelings are our emotional reaction to our perception of the outside world. So you could feel happy or angry or sad. You could feel a multitude of feelings all in one day. And it doesn't mean that uh, you should just always be sad if you're grieving or you should always be feeling one thing. We are humans. We are complex creatures. We could have more than one emotions at one time. Um, so these are just reactions, right? And I also want to emphasize like feelings are valid. When people say like your feelings are valid, you get to feel how you do because that's how you react, right? Like we can't help those things because they are emotional reactions, right? But what we can and have more control over are thoughts and behaviors. And why I want to emphasize that is that feelings are valid, but feelings are not facts. So I kind of want you to reflect on how you talk to, you know, your friends, your family, and kind of how you express these things, because sometimes we feel attacked when our feelings are called into question, when we're really kind of presenting them in a factual way, and like a lot of parties get, end up getting hurt. So I just wanted to kind of like clarify that, that fe all feelings are valid, but they're also not facts. From behaviors, behaviors are actions that you do. So like your thoughts and your feelings, they lead to the type of behaviors that you have. So our behavior is really influenced by our thoughts and feelings, right? So for example, um, I, like, I'm gonna give you an example of like what I think in lab. Um, so my thought could be, uh, what if I fall behind in lab? I don't think my lab leaders like me. Um, I don't think I'm really well prepared. Those are thoughts, right? The feelings that could come from those thoughts. I think I feel really anxious because I'm not working that hard and they might think I'm not good enough for debate. So I kind of feel like I'm, I, I feel really anxious um, and I feel kind of like sad and left out. Your behavior because of those things, maybe you can relate, right? Like you didn't maybe participate as much in lab because you think that lab leaders won't like you. You think that like uh, other students are going to think that you're not as advanced, any of those things, right? So that behavior of not participating is what you do because of the thoughts and feelings, right? And I had this a lot and it's really the, the mindfulness part is being able to recognize that you're doing those things, not just doing them, but you're recognizing that, hey, I'm not participating because I'm kind of feeling anxious because I'm having all these negative thoughts, right? That's really what mindfulness is. Um, this next part, is, this is just like a little, um, I like this little uh, diagram and this little um, uh, visual because it kind of shows that how our behaviors can influence feelings, can influence thoughts and vice versa. It's not one linear thing, but they all influence each other, right? So this is just like another visual of what we could do like, um, you know, not doing well in lab because I'm a bad debater, you could feel anxious, insecure, or worried. And the behavior that you might exhibit is like, you're not going to ask questions, you're not going to participate, you're not going to talk to anyone, right? These are all things that we have control over. But being mindful is kind of like taking a step back and uh, deciding whether or not those things are productive or even good for us. Are those thoughts good for us? Are those feelings beneficial or productive? Are those behaviors that we are in control of and exhibiting uh, beneficial to us and those around us, right? That is really what mindfulness is. Next, ants. I like the little graphics. Ants is automatic negative thoughts. I want you to think of your negative thoughts and everything that you say badly about yourself or other people as little ants. Little ants all over yourself, little ants all over your body, and negative thoughts really do invade your mind like a picnic. When you're not aware of a little thought or a negative thought um, on you, they will just keep piling up. Right. This is why it's really good to kind of recognize when those things happen, because it's at least taking a step back and recognizing that you're having those 
feelings and thoughts in the first place. Um, so let's move on. Um, this is really important if you all want to do more research or like kind of like pause this and just kind of take notes uh, for the different type of ants. I've been very guilty of this and these are things that I've had to unlearn. Um, but also I think that everybody just isn't aware of and what we could do is kind of be better, right? So types of ants, like automatic negative thoughts, these are things that we all kind of do and maybe you have done too, right? So one, the all or nothing ants. It's when an ant invests your brain and thinks everything's good or bad. Everyone from that school is mean, or if I don't get into this school, I'm never going to be successful, right? That's an example of all or nothing thinking. Always thinking. Then when you think in words that generalize, such as always, never, or every time, or I always lose to framework team, and that judge never votes for me. Every time I debate that school, I lose. Like this kind of thinking is what makes you feel like you're not in control of your own actions or your own behaviors and you're doomed to fail. That is the type of ant that you may have. Um, next. Thinking with your feelings and right thoughts like this occur when you have feelings about something and you assume it's correct and you never like even question it. Uh, for example, like I just feel like I'm never going to win top speaker. I keep making it to top three and like top two, but I'm never first. So like why even try Right. These are the feelings that you have because maybe you feel insecure. And so that's how you act on it. Right. The next thing, guilty beating. I have done this a lot and maybe it was like the Catholic guilt or just like maybe culturally, uh, but it's like thinking in words like should or must or ought to in order to use like excessive guilt to control behavior. It's like, I should be cutting more cards even if I didn't get enough sleep. I should be studying even if I'm it's already like 2 a.m. and I didn't get any sleep and I should be taking care of myself, but I should be doing that because I should be working hard. When you kind of guilt beat yourself like this, you're not doing anyone any favors. You're not helping yourself. You're not really helping anyone because you're not taking care of yourself. You're just telling yourself what you should be doing instead of like what you can do in order to take care of yourself. You're just kind of like beating yourself up. Um, next, the labeling app. Uh, this is what a lot of us have to unlearn, and I really hope that you speak more kindly to yourself. It's when you or you call yourself or someone else names or use negative terms to describe them, like I'm a loser, I'm a failure, I'm lazy, I'm really not good, I'm this, right? When you labor yourself like that, you don't give yourself opportunity to grow, and you also don't give yourself, um, you don't give yourself any credit. Um, we are our own, our own, our own worst critics and oh, only we can improve ourselves. Uh, the next thing is the red ants, which is really the worst of the bunch. Um, for, first is like fortune telling. Um, these are more so, so like negative behaviors that I really hope that we can all improve on. It's when we're predicting the worst and you don't know what will happen, right? It's like, oh my God, I just submitted my final paper and I know I'm gonna fail. I just know it, I feel it and I know it, right? It doesn't really help. Maybe it gives us more control because we are fortune telling something that's negative and that we're preparing ourselves to happen, but it's not really helpful when we are making ourselves anxious about it, right? So the next thing is mind reading. It's when you think that you know what someone else is thinking, even if they have not told you or you didn't ask them. I already know that they, they don't like me. I didn't talk to them, but I just, I just feel it. Or I, I know what they're thinking. Maybe you feel like that's in competition or with other teams or, you, or people you don't know um, or you don't know, but this is another type of ant, mind reading. It's like an automatic negative thought. And honestly, the worst one, um, absolute worst, is blame. Um, this is blaming others for your problems and taking no responsibility for your own success or your own failures. I hear this a lot, and sometimes I, I try to use this as a learning opportunity, but it's also a little bit upsetting because it makes other people feel bad um, for things that are out of their control. I hear this often, where it's like, it's your fault that we lost that round because you didn't read what I handed to you. Right? It could be post round or in the hall, but it's really harmful and detrimental to your partner and also to your teammates to hear things like that. You have no control over the round after it's over and all you do is blame instead of improving, right? And whenever you begin a sentence with, it's your fault, um, you blame others. So please try to take responsibility for your own actions because it's just creating more of a negative world. Um, so applying those type of ants to um, what I kind of see in debate rounds, um, these are uh, these are just categories that I kind of like place, but these are all uh, they could all apply um, to different places. So one, you could be preoccupied by what others think about you at this tournament. You know, like always thinking, fortune telling, like I'm going to lose if I encounter this team. I just know I'm going to lose when you when you tell yourself those thoughts. Uh, next thing could be valuing people based on wins or losses. Right, uh, debate is not a popularity contest. Uh, just because you didn't make uh, you didn't win so and so tournament 
or because another came beat you doesn't mean that you are less valuable as a person or someone is more valuable because they have more wins than you. When you put those values on just wins and losses, you take away the per uh, someone's personhood and just base their value on what they produce. And that's not how we should be as people. And um, dogmatism, I'll just define what dogmatism is, but um, dogmatism is a tendency to like lay down principles as just like true without ever considering other evidence or opinions. So an example that I kind of hear about this like in debate or if I were to use this in debate term, is like if someone was very dogmatic about like a feminism, a feminism K, uh, like you, you don't take any, um, you don't take any criticism about like white feminism or how fem uh, feminism has been like harmful because of it uh, being palpable to just like white women you know, first waves of feminism, like kind of those things when you don't take into consideration um, other opinions or evidence that can also feed into this negative thinking. And the last most important thing is um, normalize hostile communication in and outside of debate. Like I said earlier, we are trained to be assertive, we are trained to be hostile because debate is competitive and it is combative, combative and you don't, uh, you don't really debate to understand, you debate to win, right? There's a win and a loss in every round. But when you talk to people and we engage with people in real life, it's not debate. And sometimes we get too into our feelings and we get into that competitive uh, spirit. And sometimes we ended up bullying people who aren't debaters because we are just aggressive in the way that we speak, right? We may think that we're right, but we're really just intimidating other people into compliance instead of trying to understand, right? So this is something that I think we should all be mindful of because we don't really want to exclude anyone from conversations just because you have the advantage of knowing debate. So next, last part, vibe checks as praxis. I love this from urbandictionary.com. Uh, vibe check, uh, spontaneous and random time when somebody checks your vibe. A vibe check should be a pleasant experience where the person being checked is vibing, right? Uh, praxis, maybe you've heard this, it's like, yeah, praxis, when somebody says it on like social media, it usually means in practice or um, in action. So it's like a practical application of a theory. So it just means that like, are you about it or not? So. There are different ways to vibe check, right? Like what I said, everybody's going through something, even if you're on camera and things are fine, we don't know what happens afterwards. Like you have your own lives, you have your own worries and you have your own responsibilities. And it's really important, especially now that we lead empathy, we lead with empathy, care and patience with each other, especially your friends and loved ones. And I know that they'll appreciate it. So self care and vibe check should be like look different to everyone. So I hope these examples are a little bit helpful. Reaching out to your friends seems like a minimum, but uh, just, let's do it. Reach out, like send them memes, send them DMs, just even something funny. It doesn't have to be about what's happening in the world or even checking in with how they're feeling if they don't feel like talking to you. Sometimes it could just be being there, just letting them know that you're there. And if they want to reach out, they can, right? Um, secondly, self-care self -care and self-love. I know so many students that are leaders and they lend themselves so much to their team, but sometimes they neglect themselves. And a lot of us who are like nurturing and want to help we also need to learn how to love ourselves and also make sure that we take care of ourselves in order to take care of other people. Um, third, um, no thoughts head empty. If you don't know this meme, you should look it up because it is a great meme. Um, take a screen break, watch track in your head. Also a meme that you should be looking up if you don't know what I'm talking about. Um, I want to emphasize this because it's okay to not think. You do not have to always be productive. Your productivity does not dictate your worth. Life's a marathon, not a sprint. And I really mean that. It's okay to not think all the time. You are always thinking. When I say there's like 60,000 thoughts in your head, at least don't think. Just head empty. Just try not to think for a while. It's healthy and it's going to be fine. Um, next, also just try to practice with um, practical tools that you may have. Uh, breathing, studying techniques. Uh, one thing I would suggest that I found recently was the Pomodoro method. I've introduced this in at least my lab. It's when you study for 25 minutes and you take a five minute break. And if you do a little bit more research about it, it kind of gives everybody a task to kind of focus on and like take a break. Uh, the reason why I say to kind of look up these breathing or studying techniques or like have a healthy sleep cycle is because we don't really do these things to take care of ourselves and the way that we have been trained in education, the way that we've been trained to learn isn't really that helpful, right? Being in school for long hours at a time and just being so fatigued and tired isn't the most beneficial or efficient way and especially when everybody learns differently. So I wanted to encourage you all to find ways that you receive this information and a way that you want to continue learning, right? So um, these are just different ways that you might want to check in with your friends. So I hope um, these tools were helpful. Um, and lastly, I just wanted to say thank you for tuning in. And if you're here, um, I just want to say that I'm proud of you for being here. 
Um, I'm going to say that again because I really do mean it. Um, I'm really proud of you. And if you got here late, but you're still here, I'm proud of you. If you had mad anxiety um, earlier about lab and you didn't participate as much, but you still showed up, I'm, I'm proud of you. If you have responsibilities at home and you're still at camp, I'm proud of you and we don't hear that enough. The fact that you're just here and doing the best that you can, even when you're not at your best, I really am. I'm really proud of you because that's all we could really ask for. We care, I want to emphasize that we care about your mental health. We care about your health and your well being above all else. Like everything else is secondary. I know it's camp and we want it to be fun, but I just want to emphasize like expectations are expectations that you put on yourself and we just expect you to be good people. Um, and I'm just like really proud and fortunate to be part of a community with such wonderful people and students and debaters that are leaders and show like and just show empathy in and just how they are. Uh, that just really makes me happy because I just know that the best people and advocates are coming from our leagues and that just makes me so proud. And you know, I know that being a teen is hard. Um, it's been like a few years, uh, but being a student is hard. Um, sometimes I recognize that like us as adults, we, need, we kind of lose sight of that because we're into work. We try to like make sure that we're um, educating y'all enough. Um, but you know, please don't ever think that you're not good enough to be in debate. You are always enough and you're always good enough and don't let anyone else tell you otherwise. So please don't forget to take care of yourself um, before you take care of others. Um, so sorry if that was a little bit cheesy and long, um, but next we have the wonderful Brooke to talk to you more about um, self-care and mental health and how we can kind of like relate that to the debate arguments you might encounter.